It's, uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, so this is the um, Technology for Society panel. So thank you all for being uh, with us. I'm going to just uh, make a, a short uh, introduction in Spanish. Uh, estamos uh, transmitiendo en vivo en este momento. We are going to be in uh, live transmission with El Financiero and Bloomberg. And we're here at the World Economic Forum. This panel is called Technology for Society. And the forum has given us this session. It's going to be transmitted live in Mexico and Central America. Thank you to all of you for being here. And we're grateful for the support of the forum. The panel is going to be in English. We do have interpretation if you need it. And we would ask all of you to please turn off your cellular phones or uh, silence. For society uh, panel. And um, I just want to make a very, very short introduction on where we are uh, in Latin America in terms of uh, uh, technology. According to the World Economic Forum uh, IT uh, report, the last one, um, there's this uh, networked uh, readiness index 2015 where uh, Chile stands at uh, position number 38 uh, in the world. Mexico stands uh, in position number 69, Brazil uh, at position 84, Peru uh, at the 90 position, and uh, Guatemala is uh, 107. Singapore is the number one country in the world, uh, according to this uh, network readiness, uh, readiness index. And we're here at this uh, Technology for Society panel to answer the following question. How can technology drive economic growth and social progress in Latin America? Uh, we, we, with all us uh, here in the panel uh, are with me as well, uh, Tadeo Sarroyo. He is the CEO of uh, USL and AT&T in Mexico. Thank you for, for being with us. Uh, Eduardo Coelho, he's a senior VP uh, for Latin America and the Caribbean for Visa. Thank you, Eduardo, for being with us. Morning. Sebastián Belagamo, he is uh, uh, from Internet Society. Thank you, Sebastián, for being with us. Adriana Oreña, she's the managing uh, director of uh, Spanish-speaking Latin America for Google. Adriana, thank you. Thank you. And uh, Claudio Sasaki, uh, he's the co-founder of uh, Geeky in Brazil. Claudio, thank you for being, for being with us. So I'll, I'd like to make a, just a, a short uh, a question for uh, everyone here uh, so that we can open up the discussion. And first, Tadeus, I would like to start with you, asking how uh, can technology be oriented to create uh, uh, businesses and uh, to spread wealth? Uh, well, now you're in Mexico, but uh, also what do you think of Latin America? Sure, sure. And I think, obviously, I, I look through, through my lens as, a, uh, as an infrastructure provider and mobile operator. Uh, but as I look at this and I look at the advancements taking place today and, and frankly investments in network infrastructure and in particularly mobile broadband, I think we're, we're really at the forefront of what will be an ushering in of, of a new generation and, and the advancement of a mobile and digital society. And with that, ultimately, I think we're creating the fuel for an ecosystem that, that can have a substantial impact not only on businesses, not only on our lives, but frankly on society as you look at tapping into these new capabilities and the ability to ultimately cross that di digital divide by tapping into now what is becoming these ubiquitous, these always on, these always available mobile broadband uh, networks that now get coupled with, with ultimately the ability now to connect people, to connect things and drive advancements and driving the context under which how we interact with that. I think we're at a unique point in time now when you look at the number of people and things that are connected in some way to the internet exceeding the population of the planet and you look at a few years ahead to ultimately the explosion in that and I think that this, this oxygen that will in the form of this mobile network will ultimately create a, a substantial number of new opportunities to disrupt businesses and society. Is this going to take a long time in Latin America, more time than in other uh, parts of the world? I think, frankly, that we'll see that advancement continue at a very rapid pace. Uh, you know, if I look at Mexico and, and frankly, what, what we're doing here and, and the commitment we've made to advance, frankly, fourth generation uh, LTE mobile broadband services to cover a population in Mexico of over 100 million uh, inhabitants, I think you're going to see that ultimately and that increase in competition drive an advancement at a much ra more rapid race than you would have been in the past. Uh, now, Eduardo, uh, I think you've seen uh, technology all over uh, the spectrum of, of uh, Visa. Uh, who do you think are the best tech 
entrepreneurs uh, in Mexico and in Latin America? Because uh, we might think that uh, governments, for example, as they have resources, they might be that, like I mean the, uh, the very best uh, uh, big uh, you know organization to to deploy technology all over uh, its um, its work. But uh, what about banks? Uh, are, are banks better than uh, uh, other organizations? Uh, small businesses are also uh, tech oriented. What do you see when you um, uh, evaluate all your strategies from Visa? Well, we see the strategies in two ways. The first one is we need to see the network as uh, the tool to really connect everybody. So we connect consumers with the merchants, with banks, and the network needs to stay in the center of everything. A key strategy there is also to keep the network secure. Because now that everybody can have access to that network, we also need to be seeing all the things that we have to do to keep the integrity of the network. In the other side, you have the device or the point of contact of the consumer with the network. And in that regard, that's where we see a lot of innovation in the markets. We see that a lot of companies are investing on how to improve the interaction of the consumer with the network. And that is, uh, that is done through a uh, better uh, application at the point of sale, the traditional uh, terminal that we see in the stores but that is also true in the way that the consumer can interact with um, a, a, um, you know, a supplier or, or a company or a, or a merchant through a mobile app or a mobile payment uh, through different ways. Uh, right now we are um, having a, two very strong uh, trends. One is to have the physical card more secure through uh, microchips, but on the other hand, we are also working a lot on how can we include into the phone all the credentials of our cards that can be used via an, a, uh, you know, a, a close uh, a, an NFC transaction or through the internet, uh, the, like another e-commerce transaction. So we see the innovation in the network, making it secure, adding more value to the merchants, but also we, we see a lot of innovation at the point of interaction of the consumer with the network. But is it always for the creators of the network, network to create uh, and guarantee security? Because it seems that, the, on the other hand, uh, like everyone can just uh, innovate whatever they want uh, without uh, taking care of security because the network is guaranteed by some other large organization in terms of that. Probably you have a perspective on that. Well, in this case, uh, I mean, Visa is the largest uh, network uh, for electronic payments. And yeah, it is our responsibility to keep it secure, but also to, and we are working a lot to make it more open for everybody who wants to be connected to the network. We are transforming all of our platforms to be able to offer that to the develop developers in order for them to include the, the payment in part, as part of their uh, applications. So security is our responsibility. Is, I mean, we are the guardians of that information that is flowing around the system. But the, the thing is, it needs to be secure, but it needs to be open. Sounds like um, contraintuitive, but it is, uh, it is our work to do it. You want to jump in with that? No, I, I basically echo uh, what Eduardo says also for us, privacy and the power of having control on your information as a user is key for Google. So it's similar on those lines. Now, Sebastian, I would like to ask you, uh, uh, can you give us examples of uh, how innovation-based uh, uh, technology, you know, you, your organization is, is about the spread, uh, to spread the use of uh, the internet. Uh, which typical innovations do you see through the internet while you push uh, to, to, uh, for this platform to be more open? I think the, the good thing about this, uh, the internet technology in particular is that it provides a lot of uh, benefits for, for society. It's not just for the technology itself, it's also the benefits that provides to everyone. I mean, it's a big enabler of growth, of uh, development. Um, and we see that there's a big change in that because in, uh, historically, uh, the uh, innovation has been based, I mean, has benefited of the network eff effects of uh, physical clusters uh, so far. Typically, uh, Silicon Valley, uh, where uh, knowledge, inputs, assistance are get together in, in, in one physical place. What, what uh, are we seeing now is um, a big opportunity for our region now because most of these uh, necessary uh, components, ingredients for, for innovation, are moving online today, and uh, we are going to be able to, to benefit from that. I mean, let's take, for instance, um, uh, knowledge. I mean, education and research. You can take courses online. You can access open source in, uh, research on the market gaps that you want to fill 
with, uh, with your new startup, um, input, uh, capital. Uh, you have capital available online today. I mean, uh, crowd uh, crowdfunding, crowdsourcing. Uh, you have um, skilled workers available for, for you online today, LinkedIn. Uh, you, you go to LinkedIn, you, you, get, you get the workers. Uh, you get assistance too. I mean, you get mentorship for your new, your new endeavor. You get um, everything that has benefited the, uh, this uh, physical, geographical uh, cluster so far has moved online today. You have the, in, in, in I, I missed one, which is really very important, which is the equipment. I mean, you don't even need the equipment today. I mean, you, you have the capacity for your um, servers or whatever you need in order to, to run your business. You can, you can have it online, I mean, also. So, so this, is, this is the shared economy, right? This is a, a, everything uh, resides on the cloud and uh, we can all just access from wherever we are. That's correct. That's one side of the, of the equation. The, the other side is how you, as an entrepreneur, can benefit of those, of, of those resources. Those are available today online for you, independently of, of uh, where you're located, of uh, your income, of your uh, education level, of your gender, of your, even if you're uh, a physically impaired people, you can access these, these resources even better than, than do, just but do, do you see them? Do you see all these entrepreneurs all over Latin America jumping up into these opportunities? Totally, totally. Yeah, it's uh, thriving. I mean, the, the environment is thriving. Uh, is it a specific sector that you see uh, like more uh, vibrant? Uh, there's many. I mean, there's there's a big champions. I mean, historical champions. I mean, in, in, in Latin America, and it's 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 also a matter of uh, some national uh, particularities. I mean, there's uh, some big champions coming from Argentina, for instance. Why? Because Argentina doesn't see. Uh, they don't trust their own their own market, so they see the global market. I mean, uh, when when when, when 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 they start, um, the internet, for instance. I mean, the internet allows them to reach out with low distribution costs to a market of 3 billion people now. I mean, so there's the shift I'm, uh, I'm seeing is people looking from looking to the local markets to the global market at once. This is very interesting because you said Argentinians don't trust uh, their own markets, but they, they look uh, at the global market. But uh, I'm going to just make a quick change of what uh, we uh, uh, had this uh, according uh, before. But uh, you trust your local market, right? Because you created a, a very uh, relevant uh, a, a new company devoted to education. Well, yeah, I guess um, that, that's one advantage, I think, in Brazil, because we have a big market. But that's, on the other hand, when you talk about internet, that's also an issue because I think Brazilian startups t tend to think about local markets as opposed to global markets. So that's, that's one thing in Brazil. But I echo what you're saying. I think there's been a huge movement in Brazil over the last few years Primarily, I think it's a new wave of entrepreneurs that are really dissatisfied as to what government actually should have offered or should offer. So when it comes to healthcare, education, um, security, awareness of information, there has been so many initiatives to try to help population. So um, as an example, like in healthcare, you know, basic information, but um, awareness of this information. There is one very famous website now that allows people, primarily people from classes C, D, and E, to um, know where they can get free access to medication, for example, or free access to doctors, because they know it's available, but they don't know where to get. So that's one clear example. The second one is really, there's a very popular um, company that what they do, they have roughly 30 million users right now, but what they do is they, um, they inform people about everything that is free. It comes to arts, ex exhibitions, education opportunities, um, healthcare opportunities, everything that is free in the city, it's concentrated in just one website. So that's another example. In our case, um, it's really the, pe people don't realize how um, bad the situation is in Brazil when it comes to education, like for example, for every two kids that start high school in Brazil, one quit, so he, he doesn't finish high school. And out of those who finish, 90% 90, 90 doesn't have the minimum expected level of math and Portuguese. So that's the country we're talking about. So when it comes to kind of democratizing top quality education, that's what we do 
Um, and it's really the power of technology to, one, provide feedback and information to teachers, to school principals, and to students in real time. So that's a big difference. Like, to give an example, in the state of Sao Paulo, which is one of the largest ones, when you do an initial assessment um, in every uh, public school in, in Sao Paulo, it takes on average like nine to 12 months for teachers to get the feedback. So, I mean, you, you don't do anything with that information. You use it next year with, with, with a new student or a new class. When it comes to, on the other hand, you can provide that kind of real-time feedback information. So that's why I think uh, there is this wave of new um, initiatives that combine business and social purpose that is really flourishing in you, Brazil. You've been in business like what, like seven years or so? No, Geeky is a three and a half year company, so it's a new company. Uh, would you say it's advancing, advancing at, at the speed that you want? Oh yeah, I think, I, I think it was actually, a, give you an example, last year we reached three million students throughout the country. We are in 90% of the cities, all the 27 states. So that's the beauty of technology, and I think if you are able to build your business around something that is scalable, you are able to benefit a large number of people. Now, Adriana, your company, well, Google, everyone knows Google, uh, is, this is a very widespread and large global platform. Uh, how does Google uh, push uh, towards technology for, for people just to, uh, to start something new? Yeah, let me start by, if we, if we go back to our mission is to organize the world's information and make it accessible, easily accessible. So when you think about that, you see basically three groups of people uh, that we can influence or impact to generate more economic impact. One is the user, and how do we do that? Basically empowering them with information so they can make decisions or they can inform themselves. So putting platforms uh, such as uh, video conferencing, chat, email, and all these other um, tools for them to connect. The other is the companies. Right? And we have big and small companies. I think uh, on the small companies, it's is very interesting because our chief uh, or our main source of revenue is advertising. Uh, and as uh, Sebastian mentioned, uh, for an SMB to get access to the world, uh, it's key. And through the internet and through online advertising, you can be uh, what we call a micro multinational. So you are getting access to the world. Is, and that, that's is, key. Is, that, is that actually happening? Uh, yeah, that's actually happening. Uh, in, in Latin America, I mean. In Latin America, more so. And it's key because if you look at the numbers, today, 99% of the companies in Latin, Latin America are, are small companies. And they are responsible for two-thirds of the employment. And depending on the country, 50, 30 to 50% of the GDP. So that's key and that's happening. It's easy. There are no barriers to entry. Can you give us an example? Uh, yes, we have uh, several, but let me give you being Colombian, there is a company in Colombia that basically sells uh, hats to all over the world. Uh, the, the different shareholders are in different parts. Uh, one is in Panama, the other is in Colombia, and they sell hats, Panama hats, to all over the world. A more dramatic example is a small company that, that sells uh, pig, cooked pig, lechonas, uh, through the internet. Who thought about that? Well, they just found this channel of of distribution, and they are selling food over the internet. I mean, that's, uh, that's revolutionary for them, right? Something that they, they haven't thought about. For the big companies, it's, it's, it's clear also. You can either em embrace the technologies and be more efficient internally by using it uh, internally for your internal communications or going uh, uh, to the world uh, through advertising in a more concise and relevant way. And then, for the partners, which are basically all the relevant content creators, uh, there is a huge ecosystem that they benefit economically from that by putting content that is relevant for the user. Uh, Tadeusz, when, when you listen to all these uh, examples, what do you think would be like the ideal process uh, to create wealth uh, using all this technology? Because you are at the core of deploying this technology in a country like Mexico. Sure, and it's been a very interesting discussion as you think through all the variant ideas that we've gone through here, but I think at the culmination of everything is I think it's very obvious to see how ultimately 
the internet and how it's becoming embedded in our personal lives, how it's becoming embedded in businesses to ultimately really drive uh, an outcome-based society, driving a much more collaborative and, and sharing economy. But ultimately, as you think about this and you think about the culmination of these ideas, it's everything imagined as a service. When you take, when you take a, any object, you attach compute to it and you connect it in a mobile way to the internet, you create smart objects, you create the ability to create new innovation. As you continue this pivot and we become much more of a software-based society, anything you can imagine, and to the point made earlier, you don't need to ultimately have and be able to stand up and, and embed that infrastructure. That infrastructure is already available around you. There's multiple platforms. So it's, we're only limited now by our imagination. Our imagination to think and create services, to create and extend services, and ultimately then bring those ideas to bear. I think that be, really puts us here at the early point of where old, small entrepreneurs can have huge impacts. Okay. Small entrepreneurs with big ideas and access to the infrastructure that is now available around us can frankly make huge impacts. And I think we're, this ecosystem will continue to grow. This ecosystem will grow as the opportunities, whether it's disrupting education, whether it's ultimately extending and improving economies uh, through, frankly, tapping into those capabilities. But as I look at this, I, find, I, I see us really at the very early phase, and I look at across Latin America now, with the advancements, frankly, of infrastructure, with cloud capabilities, the mobile internet as an ability to leapfrog what would have been a much slower process in a fixed world. It, it sounds very well when you say like uh, there's like limitless uh, imagination, but for example, when we, when we think about banks, uh, it seems that banks are always like this very big, uh, you know, like, uh, um, I don't know if obsolete, but <laughs> actually quite big and uh, difficult to move uh, organizations. What do you think of that when you listen, uh, Eduardo, to all these um, uh, what uh, just uh, Tadeusz told us about uh, limitless imaginations. When you see a bank trying to innovate, uh, is that possible in a, in a rapid way? Actually, I think banks are doing a lot of work on innovation. Mm -hmm. um, you start seeing some cases in the world where uh, you can open an account and get a card in 24 hours uh, through the internet. I mean, in some countries, the regulation allows banks to do that. Uh, we, we don't need, I mean, we, we need to, to keep in mind that also banks are in a, in a business that are heavily regulated because of, uh, right, because of the right reasons. I mean, we need also to, to keep the banks for the things that are good for the population and not for allowing some transactions that nobody wants. So um, one challenge is for the governments to review all of that regulation and see how is that really preventing banks to move in faster on that regard. You can see now almost every bank in the world having the, the mobile bank application where you can have access to your account. I mean, who could have said that uh, you can uh, have a, you know, your direct balance in seconds in your mobile phone? But also not going to the, let's say, sophisticated solution for also on the simple solutions. Now there are a lot of banks that allow uh, people in the, in the lower segments who can access to, to their balances through SMS and feature phones. I mean, you don't need to have a very sophisticated smartphone to also have access to your bank. So I'll say that they are doing a lot of things. Um, the, uh, the challenge is how can we also make uh, the digital money as easy as cash? I mean, because right now in most of our countries, cash is still, like in the case of Mexico or Colombia or Peru, uh, between 70 and 80 percent of the transactions are still done in cash. And there are seven reasons for that, but one of those reasons is because it is very simple to use cash. I mean, you understand it, you see it, you know how much you have it, so everybody likes to use the cash. So the challenge here is we need to make the digital money as easy or easier than cash. So that's where the innovation is also coming. Not only from the point of view of the cardholder, but also from the point of view of the small merchant. Because the merchant wants to accept electronic payments, but there are other barriers, like, uh, I mean, it was the technology, now it is becoming easier to have a point of sale, thanks of, uh, you know, a mobile phone, you can actually accept payments there, you can also do it through the internet, because you can have electronic payments. But there are also some other challenges, like, uh, you know, a small merchant wants to pay taxes, in, in a lot of cases, but they don't know how to. So they don't want to get involved in the formality, because they don't want to get in trouble with the uh, Hacienda with the IRS. So there are actually several other initiatives in the countries where governments are doing 
some things, some pilots to make it simple for the small merchant to pay taxes. Uh, also, the small merchant wants to have more benefit of having a POS terminal there other than just accepting payments, which is a very good thing because they, they can increase their sales. But they also want to sell airtime, they want to sell um, micro insurances, they want to sell lotto tickets. So we are now seeing diff different um, initiatives where the innovation is getting to the point of sale where the merchant can sustain the business, the traditional mom and pop shop can maintain the business because they can also sell digital goods. But are, are you in visa uh, against culture? Because I would say it's like, I mean, uh, all people here probably have traveled around the world and they've seen how easy it is to use a, a card vis-a-vis uh, -vis using just the cash. Uh, I think many people have seen this uh, all over Latin America, but they just, they, 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 they stick to the cash, right? Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, we are, we are always winning against cash, but uh, when you see the numbers of cash in the total world, and I'm not only talking about Latin America, I mean, like, cash has grown in the number of bills and coins, you know, the monetary value of that has grown 30% in the world in the last five years. So that means that we have more bills around us. Even with the institution of checks and, uh, and cash on the smaller transactions, it's, cash is still growing a lot. So I think the governments need to take more um, decisive uh, decisions or decisive regulations to promote really uh, the growth of electronic uh, uh, money. Uh, Claudio, is this a matter of education, like, uh, like this example or others in Latin America? Do you think this is a matter of education, how to um, educate people uh, all over the, this uh, 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 continent to just uh, uh, tell them, oh, this is easy, you can just jump in to create uh, uh, a business for yourself. No, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I was going to mention that I think this is another um, hidden factor about the power of technology. Because um, at least in Brazil, when you, when you ask kids uh, 14 to 18 years old, um, classes C, D, and E, and what, what, what your dream is, uh, I guarantee 95% of them would say either be a soccer player or be a singer, some, something that um, something fun. famous. Yeah, <laughs> so it, it doesn't necessarily require, um, um, you know, go to university, for example. So what I think technology brings is, because the issue is they don't see, when they look at what their education situation is, when they look at the opportunities that, you know, actually they can deserve or earn a, a, a good salary, uh, there's such a big gap that for them is like a just, just a distant dream. They don't, they don't see themselves in those positions. I think right now what technology brings is the ability to start a business, to create something, so what you see is there's now this big wave of um, young kids trying to learn, for example, how to code, you know, how to design a website, how to create a business, which before was just so much expensive and required so much knowledge and experience. And right now, it's, it's, it's much easier. It's faster and it's fun. So but that's but is, it for, is it for the sake of just making money? Or no, are you saying I, I, just for the sake of doing what they want to do? I think it's, some, it's for the sake of having a better life. It's for the sake of um, achieving their dreams, to build something, to have a better family. Because when they look at their parents' situation, obviously they don't want to be in that same situation. And the role models that they have, you know, kids who they identify with that came from the same situation and are now famous, have money, or kind of they made it, are soccer players or singers or actors, you know. That, that's the reference they have. Or, in many cases in the slums, drug dealers, right? They have the power, they have the money. So that's, that, this is the crossroad in which kids will choose, kind of which path they will follow. And I think what we are trying to do is to show that there is an opportunity to create a business, to create a life, to go after your dreams through education, not only Portuguese and math, but skills for life. So coding, for example, is one of them. But aren't there, uh, I mean, you just mentioned like drug, drug dealing, for example. This is a risk for all uh, our societies in Latin America. And technology is also uh, at the core of uh, the spread of these drug dealing and cartels coordinate uh, themselves with the, with the people by using technology. Uh, is, this, is this quite something that we, we should uh, care a lot about it? What do you think? Well, in general, I mean, the technology is there for, for you to use either, uh, but you can uh, change that socially. And let me give you an example. 
This was in the cover of the War magazine uh, a few months ago. And uh, there was uh, this small town in Mexico, basically not connected to the internet, very remote. And a professor there was inspired by a professor in, New in, in India that basically gave internet access to a group of um, his students to say, you know, let's change the way we teach and ask questions and look up into the internet. And then they proved that that method of education was very successful. So this guy from Mexico took the example and put uh, this at the core of his course. And there is a girl who is Paloma, who participated in that. They didn't have any internet connection. They were raising questions. Then he went back to his house. This is near Tijuana, a very, very core of the drug uh, situation in Mexico. Uh, he looked up in the internet, came with the answers, and back and forth. What happened? basically transformed the results of the school. The school took the first, uh, the, first the, top, uh, um, the top position in Mexico, and Paloma was able to uh, learn mathematics and get the highest grade in the school. So I think it's on us, leaders, uh, either from businesses or from, from the society, just to make these uh, things happen. What, what will happen, anyone, what will ha happen with the um, marginal groups or groups that are not connected, like uh, the elderly, for example. What do you think will happen? I think we're working on connecting everyone. I mean, I, and, that's, and that's the point. I mean, there is, there is some groups that are not going to be connected because they don't want to at the end of the, of the day. I mean, but... Uh, but the, are, are you thinking about, like, we're, the, the Amish or Yeah, there has not been a technology uh, in the history of humankind that has been adopted as fast as the internet. Mm. Uh, so it's, it's going to happen uh, if, eventually. Uh, and it's going to, be, to happen fast. The internet has a very, is very particular as a, as a technology because you said, I mean, it's limitless uh, innovation around it. But it's also um, permissionless innovation. I mean, you don't have, uh, as you said, I mean, you don't have to ask permission to anyone in mm. order to, to, to innovate on the, on the internet. And that's, that's the beauty of it. Um, let's take Uruguay, for instance. I mean, um, where I live. Um, and... Uh, I, you might not agree on how they did it, but they have, because they have a state monopoly for, for telecommunications still. But um, I, it produced some uh, contradictions, uh, ideological contradictions to me. Uh, but 50% um, of uh, the households are connected by fiber in Uruguay. Uh, you have free ADSL connections to everyone, every phone line, fixed line, uh, fixed line holder in the country. You have... Uh, 100% of one laptop per child uh, penetration, 70% in secondary, that is in primary school, 70% penetration in secondary school. One result of that is that the, prime, the, the first non-agricultural export of Uruguay software, uh, in, that in per capita, but also in absolute terms, Uruguay exports more software than Brazil in absolute terms. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, how you can create an enabling environment for this uh, innovation to thrive. And that's, I think, the, the task of our policymakers, I mean, and how we have how to, to work with them. As, as you said, I mean, we have to spread this technology. We have to create that environment for, for the internet to, to, to spread all over, to spill over our society. Who, 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 it, it create, who created this environment in Uruguay? Was it, was it the law? Was it, was it the uh, no, was government that, agency? Was it, were they just the entrepreneurs? It's a mix. I mean, you, you cannot do it by yourself. I mean, but it's a mix. I mean, and, and, and it's also the government. I mean, they, they have a very powerful agency for the information society, which did a, a lot of these things in conjunction with this monopoly, the, the, the monopoly operator, the state monopoly operator of telecommunications in, in Uruguay. They get together. They coordinated. They, they did it. They did. The, uh, the president that is now in office now, he used to be the president uh, one term ago, um, Tavare Vasquez, uh, he decided that OLPC was priority. And uh, Nicolas Negroponte visited Uruguay with these OLPC computers. And he said uh, to, to, I mean, he saw the computer there, he saw the opportunity, he actually grabbed the computer out of Negroponte and he didn't get, get, give, it, give it back to, to him.
penetration of OLPC in the public education system in, in primary school, 70% in, in secondary school. Would you say it was, it, it was very costly for your country or not? It was. It was. Uh, it, I mean, not in absolute terms because Uruguay is a small country. I mean, so if you, I mean, I don't have the figures and the figures wouldn't be that dramatic. But uh, for, for the size of the country, we, uh, we are a three million people country. Uh, f in, in per capita, I mean, it was a, it was a huge um, uh, cost. But it compensates. I mean, it's, I mean the, the, they see the returns in, 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 the, in the really short term. I mean. you, you said uh, there's no need to ask for permission. However, there are regulations, and uh, you told us uh, uh, before uh, the panel started that uh, you have your own perspective on mm -hmm. regulation. And I want to ask all, everyone here, uh, what do we need to think in terms of regulation when we talk about technology? Yeah, I think what's important, and I have the perspective of looking at, it's important as you look at the, particularly at different phases of maturity, that what regulation uh, ultimately approach this in a way to create and attract the level of investment to ultimately create the, 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 this level of capability. And so it's important that regulation not stifle that investment, as it, particularly in the early days of innovation and, and, and around ultimately the expansion of services that are going to create these amazing capabilities. I think there are other areas, though, where it's very important and, and where governments can act to ultimately contribute to a broader uh, social use of these capabilities, and in particular, as I look at it, really, I, I look at it in terms of the, uh, you know, promoting uh, the education system that will ultimately bring in this human influx of talent that we need to, to keep this ecosystem thriving. And so there are really important areas, I think, where we need government institutions to ultimately uh, promote the, the level of change that we need in society to ensure that we can, we ultimately have the talent that we need for tomorrow. There are other areas, though, I think it's very important that the incentive to invest, the incentive to create this innovation and to be able to tap into it, that that is left open and flexible. Yeah, in terms of banks, for example, when we talk about regulation, uh, just to say an example, but banks face like two big regulations. One is the, just the financial system regulations, which are very strict, uh, and on the other side there's a regulation for uh, just security of uh, the data of, uh, of the users. What, what do you think of this uh, whole ecosystem of regulations into place for technology to serve uh, to the financial system? I think that the opportunity is, and this is also uh, true for a lot of countries in Latin America, is yeah, it is right to have regulations on banks on their, their core of their business, which is to secure the deposit of the public. I mean, that's, that's the main objective of a regulation around banks. But also you need to have more regulations or better regulations to promote more competition in order to open that network to more players in terms of maybe having more merchants or having more uh, solutions in the market, having better connectivity. So I think that uh, still we have some opportunities to promote more um, uh, competition. The other, in the other hand, we also need to, I was in another uh, session the other day around the, the, the web that we were talking about a lot in, in terms of how easy it is to really register a patent in Latin America. And it's very hard. So if the innovator doesn't have the, the, the I mean, it, he is not uh, certain that the innovation is going to work for his benefit in, and he's going to get the payback of those investments, I mean, that also uh, demotes the, the, the innovation. So we also need to have a, a more simple way to promote innovators to register patents and to use them and to take the, the, the return of it. Do you think, uh, Claudio, that we need to educate people to follow regulations or to innovate? Well, to follow regulations for sure. Uh, but obviously you don't need to agree with all the regulation, right? So I think what we see is um, opportunities to change regulation just by influencing um, stakeholders, just by influencing users, and really creating a new way to think or address, primarily from the public system. I think it's, it's really, just in the case of Brazil, I mean, to give an example, it's, it's um, We've been, for the last three years, in all states, 90% of the municipalities, uh, and still we haven't had a direct contract with government yet. 
because of bureaucracy, because of procurement rules, because of lack of understanding of how to hire technology like ours. So the way, I mean, we, we had two options, either to just sell to private schools or to find a way to go around and benefit kids from public schools. So the, the way we found was one to, for, it's like a one pay one free model. So for every private school we sell, we offer to a public school. So that's one way to benefit the kids from the public school. The other way is really to uh, offering for free our product to whoever wants to use. So with that, we've been putting pressure on government to understand the benefits and the um, possibilities that technology brings. So it's, it's a bottom-up strategy to really try to influence regulation and policies. Yeah, if I may, uh, it's, it's very interesting because I really like the concept of ecosystem because one of the consequences of this disruption of this uh, technology is uh, that it changed the way we, uh, the governance is made, I mean, of this, of, of this stuff. Um, and there is a whole e ecosystem which is very interesting because it, it's kind of a symbiotic relationship. I mean, one depends on, on, on the other. It's not just um, bi-directional. Uh, it's it's multi-dimensional. And you have to get everyone involved in, in order to make decisions. So while you have to, uh, obviously, to, to follow the regulations that are, uh, are there, the new environment has to be set up by agreement with all the stakeholders in, in, that are, are affected by, by this decision. And that's something that is growing today. I mean, uh, this change of governance environment is very, very interesting. But that's difficult in Latin America, isn't it? It's working. It's working. It's working in several, in se in several places. Because you live in Uruguay. No, 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 in Latin America. <laughs> Latin America is working. I mean, uh, there is several issues that are being discussed today, I mean, uh, among different stakeholders in this kind of multi-stakeholder environment. I mean, governments are today more open to uh, the opinions of uh, non-governmental stakeholders than, than were yesterday. And I would say, I mean, civil society too. I mean, because civil society was also uh, wary of governments, I mean, uh, uh, before. And we're creating kind of a, a trust network between, between the different stakeholders, which is very, very interesting. Because the, other, the only way for this to grow actually is with a broad consensus I mean, uh, among, among, the, among the stakeholders. And this, this is happening. I mean, the, the concept of, of, eco, uh, of ecosystem is very, very interesting. I, I think another interesting area there, if you look at it, and just look at the context, especially as you look at how it applies to the core technology itself and attempting to, uh, to weave regulation around that, the, the rate of pace of change in technology tends to outpace any ability of any regulatory yeah. framework to, to keep up with that and think about applying frameworks and in many, many respects could be decades old to technology that is changing on a monthly or could be hourly basis. So it is important to think about the approach and the framework that allows that technology ecosystem to evolve, to emerge. But the important element, and I really agree with the point, the environment has to promote competition because competition and open and free markets ultimately allow that to thrive with a very light touch regulatory framework around that. Yeah. What yeah. would be the perspective of Yeah, you? let me let me ask a point there and it's related also to yours. So the the system needs to be dynamic in such a way that allows for that to happen and I think you mentioned this uh, fearless innovation or you yeah. know a quote here. Uh, let's think about Latin America and let's think how easy it is to get and get a, a business. I mean, if you want to establish a company, yeah. it gets really hard. And then if you want to close the company, it takes Harder. you Difficult. So I think that's something that needs to change in order for us to be more risk takers in Latin America. And I think there is another factor well, that we are not talking here, which is culturally, we're not looking at failure as something that builds knowledge. And that, that, that was not common in Latin America before. So this is positive, you say. No, what I'm saying is not, we are not yet. Oh, we're not there. Actually. Because, for example, in America, in the U.S., uh, failure is part of a process of creating, you know? Exactly, but we are not. I mean, just look at, okay. you know, some years back, when, when you look at the resume and say, okay, this guy is an entrepreneur, oops. If you, if you look <laughs> at this resume in the U.S. and they have failed, it's good because they know how to, right. you know, work really well in the system. Uh, so we need to change that. Uh, yeah, and, and adding to that, uh, you, you get credit based on your history and not in your idea. 
I mean, you don't get money based on your idea. You get money because you had a track record, you have a track record that backs your, your person, not the idea you have. It's not about getting, raising money I mean, for an entrepreneur uh, about the business plan, a, a really nice business plan. Okay, do you have any property? Yeah, to, to back that? No, I mean, it's, it's about your personal uh, background, and it's not about the, the future of your idea where you get the, the finance from. You have seen that in banks, right? Like I mean, several times. I mean, there are, there are a lot of uh, projects that uh, fail uh, very fast. But as, as Adriana was saying, and something that we're also doing a lot in, 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 in Visa is if, you, if we are going to fail, let's do it fast. Mm. <laughs> let's learn. And let's move ahead and then bring the, 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 the next idea. Yeah. Can may I just I'll make this? a comment about financial institutions in Brazil? Because we've seen um, new ideas, new technologies being developed by kind of small groups that you know, could potentially threaten big financial institutions. So I think they obviously realize that. And what they're doing right now is they are bringing startups to their ecosystem. So what they're doing is, well, because for the entrepreneur is really a you don't know your business model, you don't have a product market fit, you don't know, you know who your customer necessarily is yet, so you obviously lack a capital to develop your ideas. So what financial institutions are doing is bringing these entrepreneurs, help them um, accelerate their ideas with mentoring, with capital, and test their products within their ecosystem. So they're bringing innovation from entrepreneurs to their ecosystem, so it's a very smart way and I think both wins because for the entrepreneur is a safer environment, uh, and for the um, institution is you know bringing innovation close to them. And not only banks, uh, all the venture capital market in the world, I mean, is growing a lot. I mean, a lot of people willing to risk uh, funds to support innovation, and that is something that is growing very. I mean, now it's uh, catching up in Latin America. In the past, everybody knows that they had to go to Silicon Valley to get some funds. But now there are different funds yeah. in Latin America that are very active on, on investing on innovation. And I will say that that's one of the things that I will accelerate more yeah. in our countries because now people know that they can get funds when you have a good idea. Well, yeah. cell operator, operators also have these uh, big ecosystems to, uh, uh, you know, like uh, understand what their entrepreneurs are doing. Absolutely. Right. In fact, if you look at, you know, the approach that AT&T takes, we like to... We, we like to characterize it as we, we innovate like a startup and with startups. It's important that we infuse into our thinking the thinking of the most current entrepreneurs, along with, obviously, the large-scale investments that we continue to pursue. But to do that, you have to open yourself up to the creativity that's occurring around you, and you have to ultimately have an innovation ecosystem that you have and a platform that allows you to bring that in, understand it, consume it, and put it into practice. Yeah. I would like to open the discussion for uh, uh, our friends here uh, at the audience. Uh, if you could just uh, uh, raise your hand and say, uh, yeah, do we have a mic around? Can we just bring the, the, the microphone to, uh, to the gentleman here, please? <coughs> if you could t uh, tell us our na your, your name, please. My name is, <coughs> my name is Kumar, K.S. Kumar of a company called Sutherland. <coughs> the question I had, of course, I mean, to the panel, and specifically to uh, you know, people like uh, you know, you know, Norena from Google and uh, Arroyo from at and uh, What are the building blocks of, uh, of uh, using technology and big data for society, you know, uh, in terms of social good? Uh, I, I don't think, you know, probably we uh, kind of addressed that or brought it together for a, to get a sense for us as to what are the building blocks. And, uh, you know, how can governments in a more organized way, how can governments and business partner, uh, you know, for uh, building that basic smart infrastructure, which can create that, uh, you know, ability for the common man to to use technology, you know, and not just uh, using that as a business opportunity, as we are speaking about here. Okay. Can you? Sure, I'll start off. I think if you look at, I mean, there's there's so many examples. If you look at ultimately okay. tapping into these emerging capabilities to really have a substantial impact on society. As I look at it, and as you create this platform, you create platforms that, that allow innovators to bring these ideas to bear, you can use this for social good and improving security of the society around you. There's many examples now, if you look at, of essentially social platforms that ultimately 
co-create to share security information in real time. There's things to help, obviously, society uh, to move uh, progressively throughout a city by sharing information in terms of, of traffic and other uh, dimensions. Frankly, I think a great example is sitting right here on the panel today, using technology to change the way we deliver education. We're in an era today when, if you think about it, the access to the collective knowledge of humankind is available at your fingertips. How do we use that technology and how do we promote that to put that in everybody's fingertips? And if you look at it in terms of what's happening, whether it's massive online courses or ultimately distance learning, our ability to tap into these capabilities and ultimately extend it, frankly, up and down the, the, the social economic uh, uh, platforms is, is substantial. And, and frankly, to use this in ways to make society safer, I think that we, to do that, though, we ultimately you know, have to have the platforms available and, and be able to extend these in everywhere we, we live, work, and play. And so, again, I get excited by that, and I mm. think ultimately the, the, the potential for, for social change in a positive yeah. way uh, is, is frankly there and, and being realized in many areas. Yeah. Hey, let me develop on that. So, true on education is a key building block, uh, but also within this new society and, and world we are seeing, it is key for us to educate people in the skill sets that we need for the future. And we are not seeing that in Latin America as fast as the technology is advancing, specifically on engineering, mathematics, uh, and the science in general, so that's key. And then looking at the, at the technology in general, I see the technology as an equalizer. Let me give you a clear example of how technology can be, can be put in place in such a way that connects people, make them learn, share, and play. And this basically goes back to February when the Pope was having a video conference with children all over the world with special needs. Uh, the oldest institution in our, on earth, you know, uh, run by the, pow, the Pope, who basically acknowledges himself not to be a techie guy, uh, was able to learn from people all over the world and people with some uh, disabilities like deafness, uh, blindness, or autism. And they saw the power of sharing, learning, and playing. So I think uh, the key building block uh, for a summary, it's uh, education, and in Latin America more so across the technology, engineering, mathematics, and science. He, he even sold his iPad o over the internet, I guess, in an office. In Uruguay, yeah. actually. Correct. I actually was in Uruguay. The, yeah? the option for, for the, uh, the iPad, yeah. yeah you, you didn't buy it. <laughs> no, no. It was, sold, it was an iPad too, I guess, and it was sold by 30,000. Right. Years, <laughs> others, <laughs> Another yeah. question, please. please. Um, hello, uh, my name is David Head. Um, I've lived in Argentina now for nine months, and it took me two months to get a visa card, yeah. just to put that out there. Um, <laughs> it's painful. Um, my comment really is based around, earlier on you mentioned the Internet of Things, and we're talking about access to the data that's generated by the Internet of Things or consumed by the Internet of Things. And last year there was a meeting in, hosted in Buenos Aires that pulled together, it was organized by SEMI, a semiconductor organization, that pulled together thinkers around the, the area to, to consider how we as a, a group of nations could come together to create a framework that's a cross-nation, that's apolitical, that could push us forward in a way that we're never going to compete with Silicon Valley because we, we can't invest in the next generation technologies, I don't think. It's, way too expensive. However, we understand this market. We have a growing middle class. There are a number of things that are going to be made available or created for the Internet of Things that we could do locally. We make our own chips now. They might be second generation, but they are chips that people design for. There are 25 design houses in Argentina, and I think there's even more in Brazil. How do we pull that all together? Because I'd hate to get to next year and have the same meeting and the same discussion and no progress. Anyone? The Internet of Things. Well, I, I guess I'll start on that. And, and first, to a certain degree, I think in a modern ecosystem, there is going to be ultimately 
this problem being attacked from many uh, different angles. And I think as it relates to the, the industrial internet, the consumer internet of things, I think you're going to see that continue to emerge. But around that, in the same point, there are forums and bodies that are attacking this problem in multiple angles in terms of setting standards under which things can interconnect at a much uh, simpler basis and ultimately there, we, we can allow and create this system that allows us to move and, and make it much more porous. I do think though that in any innovation ecosystem uh, to a certain degree uh, letting it form and letting these ideas come to bear across different boundaries are really what will bring that best idea forward. Uh, while ultimately we organize around it. When you look at it and you look at something as broad and bold as the Internet of Things and the industrial Internet, I think at the end of the day that innovation and ultimately the ability, the ability for us to interconnect that will emerge as a consequence, frankly, of the bigger market opportunity that comes as we solve these problems. But there are forums, there are bodies today that are working to set standards around this. Yeah, many of these... Uh, uh Things are created, I mean, as a marketing mm -hmm. issue. I mean, uh, the Internet of Things, I mean, it's something that is not clearly defined as cloud is not clearly defined. I mean, uh, I've been in the Internet uh, for, I don't know, 20-something years, and my mail server has never been in my office here. I mean, it was somewhere else, always. I mean, it's not, it's not nothing new. Uh, now it's, that is called the cloud computing. I mean, but it, it was always there somewhere. Um, <laughs> Mm, I think the Internet of Things is the same. It's, it's a genetic term for denominating things that are going to happen that we exactly don't know exactly what, what is going to happen. But we can say that many things are going to, to get connected to the Internet. There's still the need to connect. I mean, I, I think we're still creating the need to connect these things to the Internet. We can say, we can foresee that things are going to co be connected. But I don't know why my fridge is going to be connected the internet yet. I mean, do I need to, my fridge to, to get connected? Not yet. So it's going to happen. I mean, it's going to happen eventually because uh, we are in, in the process of, of getting to, to that point. Let's go to a conclusion. Uh, we can probably have just a very, uh, for a very short um, question, please, here. And then uh, we need to ask for a, a short conclusion for everyone. Thanks, uh, Asher Hassan, um, Nea Jeevan, and Nueva Vida Americas. Uh, nice to see a Google employee wearing an Apple Watch. It's a sign of... <laughs> it's not an Apple Watch. <laughs> oh, it's not an Apple Watch. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, it looks like an Apple Watch. It's an Android. I'm sorry. It looks like an Apple Watch. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're in an era where we're witnessing a very rapid digitization and convergence of different sectors, finance, healthcare, uh, communication, education. Uh, I'm really curious to know, what do you... What will Visa, Google, and AT&T look like 10 years from now? I mean, there are clearly major disruptions that will occur in your business models, and I'd really like to get your view on what, those, what you will look like 10 years from now. Well, uh, in the case of, uh, we, we are very clear that the heart of our business is the network and that we need to continue evolving our solutions to provide more value to the consumer and to their uh, to the banks, which are our distribution channel, and also to the merchants. So we will be in 10 years still doing a lot of things on the transaction to make it more secure, more convenient, and also providing more information to everybody, to the cardholder, to the merchant. We already have a lot of tools there where, uh, you know, now the businesses, even, even the smallest one, can have more information about their markets, about the community, and how to sell more. Uh, being connected through the internet and through other uh, tools, they can also uh, sell more uh, to the global world. And, uh, and uh, I mean, the network will be still the one that connects everybody, everybody there. The next, the other challenge is, as I was saying at the beginning, is how can we become or still be relevant in the payment in a simple way as it is today in the physical world. And that's why we need to have a very simple solution for you to make a payment, just one click, or just passing your device in front of a, uh, a reader or whatever. So that's, that's the wrong where we are at. And uh, we know that uh, everybody wants to eat our lunch. And uh, we have changed a lot, uh, all of our platforms, management, procedures, and everything, all of the relationship with our clients, because we are in a more accelerated world. Mm -hmm. We are on time. Uh, if you uh, could please just give us one word or one very small phrase as a conclusion. Uh, 
just uh, to that point is, we see the way in which technology is going to solve problems, very simple problems, in such a way that it can predict that you and uh, the, your life and suggest the things uh, for the future. I, I think just technology has really created a huge opportunity for those who before just didn't see um, opportunities for them. And that comes together with um, access, comes together with uh, possibilities, comes together with innovation. So it's really, I think, in 10 years from now, we're going to see a totally different, hopefully, environment for specifically for those who are you know, less privileged than we are. Thank you. Sebastian. I think uh, in 10 years' time, what we see is this disappearance of the Internet. I mean, uh, we, the Internet will become transparent, invisible. I mean, it's going to be embedded in everything, but we are not going to notice. I mean, you don't notice electricity. I mean, it's, uh, it's a given. I mean, the Internet is going to become something like that. Yeah, and I think when I, just to build on that point, I think the, the Internet and in, in general now, the mobile Internet and what's emerging now becomes the electricity for this connected generation. And this becomes ultimately what, what funnels this next level and this next wave of innovation. Anything else about? Yeah, technology is accelerating the pace of uh, having solutions more complex inside of the solution, but very more simple in the way the consumer deals with it. So to your question later, or, uh, earlier about the elderly using the, 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 the technology, my father, his brothers, my aunts, my old aunts are maybe the ones that are more connected into the internet. <laughs> maybe because they are so fascinated with the way now they can get connected to the world, is, that's why they are getting so anxious to learn more about it. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all for being with us here, and uh, I'm going to switch into Spanish. Uh, gracias uh, a todos, por favor, uh, por haber estado con nosotros aquí en este. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here if, if this joint broadcast between El Financiero Bloomberg and Safe Travels.